The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 2. Each state party to the present covenant undertakes to respect and to ensure to all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction the rights recognized in the present covenant without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. In the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 2, we see that it states that the state party, which includes Canada, must respect and ensure to all individuals, notice that, individuals, the subject or player that's being brought forth here, the rights recognized in the present covenant. So all individuals, Canada must respect the rights and must ensure the rights that are present or that are recognized in the present covenant. And without distinction of any kind based upon race, sex, political, uh, the color of your skin, religion, or social origin. So these rights, whatever they may be, are guaranteed to the individual. Canada must ensure and respect them towards the individual. And it doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter what sex you are, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, it doesn't matter your political opinion, and it doesn't matter your social origin, if you're poor or if you're rich. These rights are recognized and they're ensured for that individual. Let's look how this works out with one application of driving here in Canada. So an individual has rights without distinction of any kind. Now if you're rich or if you're poor, if you work as a mayor, a police officer or an MP, you are subjected to the same process that anyone is subjected to when they want to drive or any person is subjected to. If you're black, if you're white, if you're Asian, if you speak English, if you speak French, if your religious background is a Christian, if your religious background is a Muslim or a Hindu, we are all subjected, these are all subjected to the same process in order to be able to drive. They must go and apply for a license or a permit, they must pass a course and then be granted that application for the permit and then they can drive. For example, if I was a mayor of a city, I couldn't go to the SAAQ or whatever automobile society you have in your province, I couldn't go to that automobile society and claim to be a mayor and say, well, since I'm a mayor, that affords me a special right, that affords me a distinction. Because I'm a mayor, you must give me a license or a permit without me having to do the same process as that Asian man had to do or that Christian man had to do. That would never fly. There'd be no operation of law for that. And, for example, if a Hindu went to the driving society and claimed to say, well, I'm a follower of religion, I'm a Hindu, and therefore I believe that I'm not subjected to have to have a permit in order to drive. The law would say, well, there, there's no distinction of any kind that, that can be applied to these rights. And therefore, it doesn't matter your status, it doesn't matter what you do to, uh, to earn, gain, or provide a living for, for you and your family. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter, again, what religious background you have, what's the color of your skin, or the nationality that you are. You are subjected to the same process. No matter what you try to claim. Looking at citizenship, a designation of citizen, we know it's that individual that's been rendered a subject and a servant. Now, everyone, most everyone, has taken the oath of citizenship or it's being implied that you have taken that oath. That oath of allegiance to Her Majesty, the Queen of Canada. Now, for example, a mayor couldn't say, or a police officer couldn't say, well, I refuse to take the oath of allegiance because I'm a mayor or I'm a police officer. Therefore, I'm afforded a different right. A, a distinction is made on my behalf because of this title. It wouldn't work because the rights that are guaranteed to the individual are not guaranteed to them and can't be claimed for any type, by any type of distinction. 
So again, if I claim the Christian understanding, and I said, well, the God of the Bible is my Savior, and therefore I don't have to take the oath of allegiance, and I don't have to be considered that citizen, and do delve in down that way, they would say, well, you don't have to make a distinction of any kind. If you claim that you're a Christian and you don't have to take the oath of allegiance, it doesn't work out. If you claim that you're a Muslim, or if you claim that, well, because I speak French, for example, I'm not subjected to the oath of allegiance, they'll say, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. If you, if you claim that, well, I was a teacher in my country before I came here to Canada, and therefore, my, because I was a teacher, I don't have to take the oath of allegiance to Her Majesty. Again, that would fall apart. If you claim that because you were an Asian man, or it's because you had millions of dollars, that you were rich, or even that you were poor, that, that granted you the right not to have to take the oath of allegiance. This de facto power would say no. You see, you're trying to make a distinction, distinction in the rights that are available for that individual by one of these designations or one of these operations. And the law doesn't provide for that. No provision. So again, I couldn't walk up to the SAAQ or to the driving society and say, hey, listen, I'm a, I, I'm a white man, I speak English, therefore I don't believe I should be an, an Christian. Let's just say, for example, I'm a Christian, I'm a white man, I believe in the Bible, I believe in, in God, therefore I don't have to be held to your, to your rules about driving. That would never stand up in a court of law. If I went to them and say, well, I'm a rich man, or I'm an Asian man, or hey, I'm the mayor, and I don't have to be held to the rules of driving, that would never stand up in a court of law. If I went before the, the, the powers that be, the de facto powers, and I claimed, well, listen, I'm a poor Asian man who speaks French, and just happens to be a police, mm, a police officer, I don't know. And therefore I'm not under subjection to have the oath of allegiance, to say the oath of allegiance. They would say there's no distinction of any kind there. You can't make that claim. There's no operation of law that allows you to do that. Or once again, if I, if I went before them and said, well, I'm a Christian man, and therefore I don't want to take the oath of allegiance, they would say, sorry, there's no distinction of any kind there that's recognized. But it's a good thing to know there is a distinction in law for us. See, all this is applicable to that individual. And that individual, meaning that legal person, that artificial person, that entity that was created in, in law and by law, that was given certain rights and freedoms of a human being. Not all of them. That's why it's referring to the individual. Now let's look at what is available for men and women. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 3. The states parties to the present covenant undertake to ensure the equal right of men and women the, to the enjoyment of all civil and political rights set forth in the present covenant. So in the article before, the designation, the player, was individual. Now we see the player, the designation, being men and women. Article 3 of the International Covenant teaches us that the state party, that includes Canada, or any signatory, United States, whatever it may be, must ensure the equal right. Now notice that. It's similar to what we just read in verse 2 for the individual. For the indi individual, the state party must ensure the rights for that individual without distinction of any kind. Here, the state party must ensure the equal right of men and women to the enjoyment of the rights set forth in the present covenant. So whatever rights are set forth, or are brought forth in the covenant for a man or a woman, okay? We're not talking about now the subject or servant. We're not talking about the legal person, the artificial being. We're talking about whatever rights are set forth in, in this covenant for the man and the woman. The state party must ensure these rights. They must ensure them. If you're under the designation of person, individual, that one being the subject or the servant, the citizen, whether it's to the citizen is to a sovereign, and here in Canada it's Her Majesty, or it's to the government itself, a democratic society where you don't have a sovereign, your government may be set up in that way. That person, that subject, that citizen has duties, responsibilities, obligations, freedoms, rights, and benefits. And this state party, your government, here being Canada, must ensure these rights for that individual, for that person. 
without distinction of any kind. Remember that. Now, the human being also has rights, freedoms. However, the human being has what we call fundamental, inalienable rights that are just, if you will, part of the human being, part of the man or the woman, because they are a man or a woman. But that human being, and human being is just the plural of man or woman, that human being has duties, responsibilities, obligations, freedoms, rights, and can actually say benefits. If they claim that they believe that everything was given to them by God, then it's a benefit for them to use the substance that was given to them by God. For example, the animals, the plants, the foods, and their, thereof. Now the state party must ensure these fundamental rights for the human being. The state party must ensure the rights for their citizens. The difference is what type of rights, responsibilities, duties, and obligations, and benefits, and privileges that the citizen has, or that the human being has. We're going to look at one specific for the human being, one fundamental. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 4. In time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation, and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, the states, parties to the present covenant, may take measures derogating from their obligations under the present covenant to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation, provided that the, such measures are not inconsistent with their other obligations under international law. No derogation from Articles 6, 7, 8, paragraphs 1 and 2, or Articles 11, 15, 16, and 18 may be made under this provision. The Emergencies Act of Canada. This is a federal enactment. The preamble, third paragraph down. And, whereas the Governor and Council, in taking such special temporary measures, would be subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Canadian Bill of Rights, and must have regard to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, particularly with respect to those fundamental rights that are not to be limited or abridged even in a national emergency. So we're looking at a couple of fundamental rights, fundamental rights and freedoms for the human being. Now, we've looked into Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and it states that even in an emergency, so even if your country is in an emergency, no derogation may be made concerning Article 8.2 and Article 16 of the Covenant. So the rights and the freedoms the liberties, the obligations, the responsibilities, whatever these two articles of law are bringing forth in the covenant, whatever they are teaching, whatever they are stating, it is saying that even in emergency, okay, these rights cannot be limited. These rights here, which we are about to look at, cannot be abridged. They cannot be taken away, they cannot be removed. They must always be fun uh, able to be called upon. They must always be able to be stood under. Now, these rights, 8.2 and 16, stand or qualify for the human being, for the man or the woman. What do you see? What they are declaring. So these are fundamental, fundamental rights, fundamental freedoms that can never be limited, never be abridged. And the covenant itself is telling us in Article 4, that your state party, your government, your government, whether Canada or United States of America, or European government, if they are party to this covenant, they can never take away, limit, or not respect, not ensure these rights that are enumerated, that are listed in 8.2 and 16 of the covenant. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 8, Subsection Point 2. No one shall be held in servitude. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 16. Everyone shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Article 8.2 of the International Covenant states that no one, no one, shall be held in servitude. 
and Article 16 states that everyone has the right to recognition as a person before the law. Now we know that the citizen, if you take that designation, the citizen is being held in servitude. And that citizen is a legal person. So therefore, this no one shall be held in servitude is not applicable for the individual as the legal person, but it's applicable as a fundamental human right and freedom for the human being. That's saying no one, that human being, shall be held in servitude. And that human being, as in everyone, has the right to recognition as a person before the law. That human being can take recognition as a citizen, can take recognition as that legal person, and take on the duties, responsibilities, and obligations of that designation. However, the man, the woman, is not forced to take on this designation. Never. Because this is a fundamental right and freedom that is guaranteed and is to be ensured by the state party and it is never to be limited or abridged. It is never to be removed or taken away. So there's no time where the state party where you live, or the government where you live, if they are signatory to this covenant, there's not a time that they can force you to take recognition as a person before the law, or that they can force you to stay in servitude or to be held in servitude, whether it's to a political party or to a sovereign. This is a fundamental human right and freedom that we all possess, that we can all exercise and stand under once we know that it is there for us to call upon. We, as human beings, always have a fundamental right available to us, and that right is that we can take recognition as a person before the law. That human being can take recognition as a citizen, can play the role, can accept that designation if they so choose. If they do not choose, the state party is not supposed to force you to take recognition as that citizen. The state party is not supposed to force you to take recognition as that person, that artificial person, that legal person. And that is a right that is ensured to us through the covenants and that Canada specifically is under obligation to obey. Now that citizen is being held in servitude and through that servitude it is taxed. And that citizen as you see in the Financial Administration Act Article 19 it must pay for privileges and rights that it gets through permits and licenses. So the citizen has obligations and duties and these obligations and duties, privileges and benefits, are placed upon it, placed upon it by the laws, the enactments of Canada. That's what's governing or controlling that citizen, that person, which you can't play. However, if you invoke your fundamental human right, as enumerated in Article 16, no matter when it is, in a time of peace or a time of war, the state party is not supposed to be able to force you to take recognition as that person. And by allowing you to operate this fundamental right, they're fulfilling their obligations towards the covenant. Because remember, the covenant said that they must ensure and respect these rights equally to men and women. And these rights, this fundamental right of not having to play any of this is yours. And let's say it's always in your pocket. You've always had it there. You could have always carried it around with you. You were just never aware of its operation and aware that it was there for you to use but it's always been there for you to use so while someone else may come up to you and say listen I'm fed up of the of the government systems I'm fed up of what's going on and I don't want to be a part of it anymore and I just choose to be free and, and that's it and that's all yeah they understand the principle of that right they understand the principle of that yeah you should be able to be free but they don't know how to express it pro properly and here through the international covenants, through domestic law, that right that a man has just to sit back and say, that's it, I'm done. I don't want to play, I don't want to be part of this, I don't want to act anymore, I just want to live, I want to pursue happiness, I don't want to build a commercial system anymore. That right is supposed to be there for you. However, as I say many times, when you operate this fundamental human right, it goes against the, the created democratic society, it goes against the commercial system, it goes against what they've instilled that is taking from your energy. So through that ta taxation, through you paying for the privileges and the rights, through you paying for the permits and so forth, 
they are making monetary value off your life. As I stated before, human life is taxed at least 40% just from the get-go. Uh, an individual's life is taxed so much, they're paying so much money just to exist, just to survive. So the, 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 the system has been set up in that way that when you begin to invoke your fundamental human rights and freedoms, they might kick back against you. But it's up to you not to allow them to remove these rights. It's up to you not to allow them to look the other way and to say, no, I'm not going to insure them, I'm not going to protect you. Listen, Canada, you signed that covenant. You're a signatory to that covenant. There are rights and freedoms that are guaranteed to me as a human being, as a man, as a woman, in those covenants. One of those is this very fact, that you cannot force me to take recognition as an incorporated person, as a legal person, as an artificial person. You can't remove my fundamental human rights and freedoms without my consent and then return to me limited freedoms, benefits or privileges through operations of law, enactments and regulations, unless I consent. In doing so, you're holding me in servitude, a human being, which again is breaking the covenant because you have no right to hold a human being in servitude.